So right now, let's get to the heart of the program, shall we? Dr. Schopner, please start us off and give us an overview of how the diseases actually connect. Great. Well, I'm going to stand up so I can see the slides. First of all, thank you all so much for being here. And there's a, one thing that's a first is all of these words, one slide, and all of these people together with these words. Because... You might not think that autism, Parkinson's, and mitochondrial disease, maybe the APMD Foundation, <laughs> would all be sitting in the same room and would be all interested in the same thing. And really kind of going back historically is when, is almost 25 years ago when we started working on these disorders and thinking about mitochondrial diseases and were identifying some of the first gene mutations and understanding how they work and all the things that keep you up at night and are great to do, nobody thought that you could ever achieve this kind of relationship and that it would be meaningful and that it would be important. So what I'm going to take you through with a few slides that I have is a little foundation for all of that and why it's important. In, I guess it was the mid-80s, after we had identified some gene mutations that were very important in these disorders, the NIH really didn't have a lot of room for really rare diseases because that's what they were. When we started, nobody even knew what a mitochondrial disease was, and we even sat in rooms, believe me, not with this many people, maybe as many at one, at one table and argued about whether they even existed. And so the first grants that we got from the NIH were to look at mitochondrial disease and Parkinson's disease. And we published, published a number of papers about that. And so there the road started. The road started among many researchers to these relationships. And so to start off with, we're going to talk about those relationships and how we got from there to here tonight. And so first of all, I've got to take a few steps back and talk about for everyone what are mitochondria so that this all makes sense. Well, everybody here, I promise you, you love your mitochondria <laughs> because it's why you eat. And like I tell people, um, you don't eat because it's a great chef, and you love that food, you eat because you want the electrons in that plate. And that's, you see, I know that that sounds really sexy when you say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're doing is you're taking the food you eat, and you're putting them in your body, and it's going to the mitochondria. Whoops, wrong button. And this is a slide of what mitochondria look like inside your cell. If this was a movie, they would be moving and turning and remodeling. So when you eat fats, proteins, carbohydrates, they go through a number of biochemical changes. They go to the mitochondria. And what the mitochondria do is they turn that into energy, ATP. It doesn't really mean get up and go energy. That's the fuel that runs many of the biochemical and chemical reactions in your body. For your brain, your heart, your muscle, all your organs. And that's an important point, and that's kind of a first point that will help understand how this ties together. But also, it's why we breathe. Over 95% of the oxygen you're breathing right now is used by your mitochondria. And it's used also in conjunction with the foods you eat. It comes in your lungs, pumped out to your tissues, goes to the mitochondria to make this energy. So it's kind of like oil that comes out of the ground. You can't just put it in your car. It has to be refined to the right kind of energy so you can use it. But what we know about these diseases, and one of the things, and I'll tell you a few things that we're working on in the lab on the research side of things, is that when you're dealing with diseases, you're dealing with a spectrum, changes that range from irreversible to reversible to normal. 
And the optimism and the true optimism and the true importance is what we know, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, and what we're working on is this part right here. The changes that you can affect, the changes you can make to push those mitochondria to more normal functioning. Because really briefly, the way that they work is tiny bits of improvement produce big functional changes. And that's really an important concept that I wish I had more time for. But because it is one of the most complicated genetic and biochemical systems in your body, it has many faces. And let me just take a second, because one of the first diseases that we knew about and established was a disease called Leber's hereditary optic neurop neuropathy in the late 1980s. That disease is so specific. It's an inherited disease. It affects the mitochondria. It's not a brain problem. It's not a muscle problem. But the very center part of your vision goes. That's it. That's how specific it can be. At the other end of the spectrum, it can affect a lot of organs, brain, muscle, heart, and everything in between. So the faces of these disorders are many. And by understanding that, I know you can understand how important all of you are and how important the research is to unify and bring together all these different types of diseases which share a commonality in abnormalities or defects in the mitochondria. A couple of more things. The mitochondria and its ability to make energy is very genetically complex. It is the only system, the only system in your body where that part of it comes from one genome, which is very small, it's made up of 16 and a half thousand molecules called the mitochondrial DNA. And that comes essentially all from your mother. It's maternally transmitted. But only about 10% or so of the diseases are caused by mutations there. And the rest of almost 700 genes are inherited usually from both parents. They come from your chromosomes and they live scattered all over your 46 chromosomes. So when you're talking about disorders like Parkinson's disease at one end of the spectrum or the many other types of disorders that the mitochondria affect, and particularly autism, which as, as everyone knows or should know, it's not one thing. It's a collection of a lot of diseases, genetic abnormalities. Is that when you connect these together, with this kind of complex genetics, you see a lot of different mechanisms going wrong, a lot of ways the system can break, and it can be highly specific, ranging from just the center of your vision to disorders like Parkinson's and disorders like uh, autism that are, have important, very important mitochondrial components. So I want to end by kind of giving you, taking that overview <clears throat> and hopefully distilling it down from the understanding that it affects a lot of diseases in a lot of different ways. And we're all up here and there's researchers working on this and the foundation for mitochondrial medicine supports how do we treat these disorders? How do we make them better? And so I'm just gonna give you little fragments of some things that are going on. And one of them is where the firefly comes from. The firefly that you see lighting up, the reason it lights up is because this burst of light is produced every time this enzyme, it's called luciferase, does its biochemical reaction and uses a little bit of ATP, the energy that the mitochondria make. So what does that mean? That means that the light is directly related to the number and the amount of energy you're making or that that firefly is making. So what happens if you took that gene from the firefly and you took cells in the lab and you put that gene into the cells so that it could go to the mitochondria? Well, we have done that and we use that all the time. And this, all this green stuff here 
is inside of the cell where the, the fireflies luciferase that makes light is in the mitochondria. So what can we do with that? That is very powerful. It's very powerful because we can use that to understand how the diseases work, and more importantly, to understand how medications improve, work, or don't work for a specific mitochondrial disease. Because if you give it and you put the medication in with the cells and the light gets brighter, it means that more energy is being made and that you're doing something positive to the way that system works. And that's exactly what we're doing right now in our laboratory, is we're working with one of the drug companies and we're looking at a brand new class of drugs, a class that has not been out there before, but that specifically works in the mitochondria. And it works to make those cells brighter makes more energy, and we're now moving toward designing and working with the FDA for clinical trials. So this is full circle, hopefully, in my talk and my side of the presentation. It's everything from back in the 80s when we didn't know anything about this and didn't even know if it existed, to now being able to sit in a room with individuals talking about Parkinson's disease and autism, and also to be able to talk about ways and approaches and real things that are happening to begin to understand how to treat these disorders and these abnormalities in the mitochondria better. So with that, I want to thank you all again, and I want to thank everybody that has worked so hard to bring everyone here together tonight for being here and for all your support. Thank you so much. In your lifetime, You've never probably had as much appreciation for your mitochondria as you do right now. <laughs> I mean, thank you. Very, and you also didn't know that it's sexy, too. <laughs> Dr. Schaffer, thank you very much. You and I had a good conversation about this last year, about the connection between mitochondrial disease and autism.